Welcome, Art Vans community. You're on the Art Vans podcast. We are going after God's heart for the arts industry. You will be inspired to be uncontained in your God-given passion, talent, and creative ventures. Join me as we interview other people from around Australia and beyond about their field of industry and how God is speaking to them, how he's influencing their field through their life of worship and how they're hearing God in the process of that and impacting their people within their field of industry. Find your wings with us as we collaborate, discuss, inspire and peer coach each other through the power of story, revelation and industry mission fueled by a vibrant life of worship. Well, welcome back, Art Vance community. Today, it's just me, and I really got something on my heart that I actually want to just spend some time imparting and prophesying and speaking into your process because I really feel as though the Lord is wanting to highlight some of the attributes that come when we are journeying into maturity on a, yes, on a craft and art form level, but also in our character. And I don't know about you, but I've sit, I've sit through many, many sermons over the years uh, where maturity has been talked about. And, uh, you know, some of those messages have been brilliant and encouraging and empowering. And some of them have been really shaming and de- and demeaning and <laughs> patronizing. And I, I know there's a lot of you that can relate out there that we're kind of really, we're, we're sick of the patronizing nature of some of these messages that come across, not because it's the person who's delivering it, but there's something deeper that the Lord wants to do in us. He wants to establish a deep, uh, a, a deep well in us uh, that is so secure and so confident and so uh, so bright shining. You know, there is a deep shine that comes out of the deep places of our process with Him, and it comes through that humility. It comes through the raw times of of waiting on Him and being at His feet and and being happy with just being still at his feet because I don't know about you but I think I've I've spent a lot of years trying to achieve that place uh, when I'm actually just called to receive that place it's not somewhere that I can earn it's somewhere where I learn uh, and it's actually that place of being on the listening end of prayer being in that space of just hearing Lord what's on your heart what are you teaching me right now what season am I in right now and what are you doing in me that's going to enrich this present time and the future to come so I'm calling this character and craft maturity continuum now it sounds really technical and theoretical it was just more had a ring to it and it kind of articulates um, what I have on my heart to share with you now guys we're all in the level playing field here and I want this space to be uh, a place where you can reach out and give your feedback and give your questions because there is so much that God is doing in your life. He's doing in the wider Aussie community of artist worshippers, uh, even not even the, in the church sense. I'm not talking about church ministry. I'm talking about people who they, their lifestyle is to worship the Lord and you work full time in, in the arts industry or you're an educator and you teach arts or whatever it may be. Um, but there's something uh, that is that is being done deeply in our hearts this time. And so this is a level playing field. And I want to just invite you again, if you haven't yet, please join the Facebook community group through our Sounds of Soaring page. It's, it's called the Art Vance Facebook group. And it's actually a group where I'm wanting to have conversation, interaction and post up some things. And I want you to post and, and encourage each other. But it's a space where you also get to ask questions and have comments and say, hey, Elliot, I'd love to hear more about this. And I'm in touch with people at the moment and I'm creating a list of people that I want to have as guests on the show. And I actually want to hear from you in the process of that because I really believe it's a, there's a powerful synergy that comes on this subject of worship and the arts because there's so many people that are deeper in it than they thought they were. Um, I don't know how many of you out there have been worship leaders for years, but you've just itched and and cried out for more and been you know uh, you got the the holy heartache for something more but you haven't been able to put your finger on it Um, and I'm not saying arts is the answer but I'm saying that there is a synergy between the two that you know worship is where we minister to the Lord and he ministers to us and the arts 
area is, you know, that's how God ministered to the people. You know, if we think about Solomon, when he got the download from the Lord, well, David got the download and Solomon ended up building the temple. Uh, but the, the work of art, yes, it was an offering to the Lord, but it actually served the people. It gave them a place of expression. It gave them a place to honor the Lord. And that's what the arts is called to do. It's called to be this space where people actually... It's a, a space provided for people to actually encounter God in unique ways uh, that they mightn't be able to interact with the Lord in, in, other, in other spaces, in other facilities or environments and cultures. So the arts is really that. That's, it's the place where you are you know, designed to be unboxed and released and uncontainable. I love that word, uncontainable. Because God couldn't fit in an ark anymore. He can't fit in a temple. He can't even fit in a human body. So Jesus, uh, you know, came as the son of God and became like us. And he came as us and he died as us uh, so that there would be a complete release from containment to live in the fullness of what you're called to do. Now, throughout scripture, I'm going to jump into some notes because I really want to just encourage your heart about this about our process, because our process can be mirrored back to us all the way through scripture. We can see the different lives and characters. But of course, if we're talking about arts and worship, we're going to focus on David for a second. I don't know how many of you have done a deep study of David. I, haven't, I wouldn't say I haven't done a deep study, but I've done a study enough to understand a few components to have a bit more of an understanding of of his what his life might have been like, what his process might have felt like, what what was what was the emotional gauges that he went through um, as as a child because he was treated as the runt of the litter. He was treated as less than. He was uh, never seen, never heard. Um, which worked as a benefit for him in the long run. But man, I reckon that would have been so painful to be treated less than, less, you know, lower class, to be treated as, oh, no, we just put him out the back of the field. No one needs to see him. Uh, you know, he, he tends the sheep. That's what he does. Um, but anyway, we can't categorize these figures, but they do work as examples that we might resonate with. David was treated as the runt of the litter. It's believed that he was in the range of 10 to 12 years old when Samuel did the unconventional with conviction and anointed him to be the next king of Israel while King Saul was still on the throne. You know, and that was taboo. That was like, you do, you do not do that. Like that's, if a prophet does that, <laughs> you know, the king can order for them to be uh, punished quite severely because that's, that's, you know, probably you could say that's equivalent to treason on a national law level. Uh, but then five to seven years after being anointed, David's king-like heart showed itself by uniquely and courageously standing up to Goliath, who taunted the nation of Israel. Even though he was only around 15 to 17 years old, he already had the nation in his heart. He already had digested that, that heart of God, the heart of a king in him, for the entire nation of Israel. And then it took another 10 years roughly for Saul to recognize the mantle of leadership on David's life, uh, even just the mantle of courage, even just that mantle to uh, stand up to bullies and to defend the nation's honor, uh, to defend the name of the Lord. You know, that was, that, it took about 10 years. Probably Saul was still so intimidated and he was wrestling his own demons, as we know. And But after that 10 years, he made David the commander of his army, uh, the commander of Saul, Saul's army. And then it took a couple of years, only a couple of years, for Saul's fears and insecurities and envy to rage against David. And he started going after David. He wanted. He got filled with that envy and that jealousy, that spirit of murder, like that which came over Cain, against Abel when he saw that God honored Abel's offering and Cain got so envious and so jealous. He just couldn't hold it in anymore. So he decided to murder Abel. And, you know, the Hebrews talks about that the, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, even though Abel's was innocent. You know, his blood cries out, give me justice, where Jesus' blood cries out, I have achieved justice. Jesus' blood cries out, mercy forgiveness, redemption, you know, and so that's powerful, right? But Saul came under this same attitude or spirit 
uh, that wanted to kill uh, God's anointed. And then it took, uh, you know, it's, it, it took a, a number of years for that, for that to play out where David was pursued by Saul. Um, and, you know, we know some of the in and out, ins and outs of that story. Um, and ultimately, David was tested a number of times, uh, one specific time in the cave when he had opportunity to kill Saul and he chose not to because he recognized you know, he'd gone through this process. There was a there was a a, a maturity continuum in his character uh, that had clicked to a certain level. Where no, I'm not going to wrestle for the crown because I know my God will give me the crown when it's time. You know, he said, "I'm not going to kill for the crown." Uh, he didn't say that, but that's ultimately what he said. I will not touch God's anointed. You know, and he recognized Saul as even though Saul was so insecure and so childish and so filled with envy and hatred against against David, you know, David would have seen this guy like a spiritual father for a number of years or not a spiritual father, but a father figure, you know, uh, and, and then this guy turns on him and just wants to kill him and is so threatened by him and gossips about him. I know there's some of you out there that would be resonating with what I'm saying. You've had people in your life that you thought you could completely trust until, well, actually know who you are that that grace on your life, whatever your you know maybe maybe you did make a mistake or whatever, um, and they've felt extremely threatened by you, and so they have to uh, turn on you and speak all manners of evil against you, you know. And Jesus said that's what will happen to us. Um, but in that space, we are blessed if we can see it. We can see that God, wow, I get to be with you in this space. I get to experience an aspect to your nature in this space of being rejected and betrayed by men um, that, you know, I wouldn't experience this aspect of God um, had I not been rejected and betrayed by men. The nature of God is beautiful in that way. It We get a revelation of an aspect of God's nature when we realize that there's an aspect, that aspect cannot be fulfilled by man for us. We cannot have that, that aspect of of. Um, loyalty to us, we can't have that fulfilled by men. It has to be fulfilled by the Lord because in him all whole, all things hold together. So uh, someone can't be loyal to you unless, you know, it's held together by the Lord. And, you know, we are imperfect and we make mistakes, right? But this is what Dave, David went through. He had to go through this place of deep betrayal, deep loneliness, even though he met his mighty men. He still had to lead them, and leadership is a lonely place. You can't just relate to everyone as your peers. You've got to lead them. They're looking to you. They're looking to you to deliver something. They're looking to you uh, to to take the first step into uncharted territory, uh, filled with danger and uncertainty. You know that's that's the the loneliness of leadership. But as you venture in that leadership, leaders rise next to you, and they you can trust them. You can say. This is, you know, this is my wrestle today and you can share the load. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the beautiful thing. And that's where mighty men rose around David and became more than just his soldiers. They became friends. But it was after the Lord had established in him a deep revelation of God's nature as the one who sticks closer than a brother. And that's beautiful. You know, it's so easy for us to fall into the attempt to keep up with the competition. You know, David would have been tempted to try and keep up with the competition. It said that he wasn't very manly looking. He was only 10 to 12 years old when he got anointed. But all his older brothers were well-built men, tall, of good stature. And they said, and Jesse said of his sons, except David, <laughs> these men, they're fit to be king. Look at them, you know. Um, they're handsome, they're, you know, strapping. But when it came to Goliath, they cowered away like kittens from a pool. You know, they became extremely timid and weak and powerless and intimidated. And David emerged from them with a wealth of history in God, of spending his time ministering to the Lord with the sheep and ministering to the Lord. And then the lion and the bear would come and he would take it down and he passed, oh, oh, yeah, some people call it, he passed through those tests, but I, I want to say he went through those character arcs. He went through those continuums. He went through those those maturity upgrades 
of, of trusting the confidence of the Lord in you. You know, and I want to encourage you today, you can trust the confidence of the Lord in you. And what I mean by that is you can trust the Lord's confidence. His confidence never wavers. He is confident in who he is. But he also has a confidence in you because he's confident in who he is in you. And therefore, there is this never-ending uh, strand of confidence and strength and authority and peace that emerges from who he is in you. So often we just feel like the competition is drawing us off our wall, like Nehemiah when he was building the wall of Jerusalem. And the men came and taunted him and said, come down to the fields, come, back, come down to the level playing field with us, you know, and, and Nehemiah refused. He said, I will not leave my assignment. I will not be called down off the wall. And it's so important to have that discernment and, and stay away from the competition of people because the competition of people will get us out of that sweet slipstream in the spirit where because our art form has to be about our relationship with the Lord. Whilst we learn from people and we learn from different, you know, more experienced people in our field and we get mentored and all of that is amazing. But we cannot live in the mode of competition. We cannot live in the mode of having to achieve and measure up to someone else because you never will. There is there is one you and that you is glorious. That you is made and designed, fashioned for greatness by God himself. And you look like him. You look like him. You sound like him. And protecting that that unique factor is so important, beloved. It's so important that you protect that space, that no one else traffics in that space, that you don't have people coming through and telling you what your motives are, telling you what spirit you're of. You've got to protect that space between you and the Lord. You hold on to that because that secret place with you, I love what, you know, Danny Silk from Loving on Purpose and from Kylo and from uh, Life Academy um, talks about where you are, you have your circles of intimacy in your life. And it's important that you know that your first circle of intimacy is you and the Trinity, you, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. That's it. That's what you've been welcomed into because of the cross Death, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. You've been glorified up into this place of being seated in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 2, and you have been glorified, justified, sanctified into that place of communion with the Trinity. That is just an amazing, we could just sit on that topic just for, for a few podcasts and we wouldn't even scratch the surface, right? You know, that is where you have been brought to. You've been brought to completion in that sense. Jesus has finished that work. What we're working on is is walking in that in this life, <laughs> establishing that as the beachhead of is where I'm going to live. That is what I'm going to operate from because that's where I've been placed by the goodness, the kindness of God, by the Holy Spirit. I've been placed into the favor of the Father. I've been given the very favor that the Father bestows upon Jesus. And Jesus is in you, and you are in Jesus. Therefore, you are doubly loved and doubly favored. Now, just try and get over that. That's just never, you're never going to mount that mountain. You're never going to get over that revelation because that is where you've been placed by the sacrifice of Jesus. He became sin so that we would know, so that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So in Christ, that's where you are. Okay, I don't know where I am because I'm so <laughs> stuck on that. And that's a beautiful place to be stuck. So let's let's be stuck there. Okay, that's the beautiful place. But that's the circle of intimacy between you and the Trinity. That's where I am. The next circle out from that is if you are married, that is, that is the circle of intimacy with you and your spouse. That is to be protected. There shouldn't be any traffic in there, not even the little kids. You know, <laughs> then the next circle out from that is is where you have your, your, your father or your mother to children. That is the next place of intimacy. That is the next place where you are known and you know. You are, you are connected. It, it, is, it is that covenant love. It is that covenant commitment and dedication. You've been brought together. And 
The next circle out from that is those closest friends. You know, Jesus had his Peter, James, and John. I believe Mary was in there too. I believe Mary Magdala and and also Mary, his mother, was very close to Jesus. Mary, both Marys were at the cross when he was crucified with John. Uh, John was there. And that there was just a very intimate uh, interaction and bond between those those ones and Jesus. Uh, and so it's important to have those people in your life. It's important to know who's my Peter, my James and my John, because that is that is going to be a, that is going to be your your micro community uh, that's apart from your family. OK, that's going to be your dearest friends that you call upon. Uh, those are going to be your your prayer partners. They're going to be the ones that are calling you into the best you. They're the ones that are going to be calling you into the best version of yourself. Uh, and they're the ones who are going to be championing your marriage, your parenting. Uh, they're going to be championing all of that. They're going to be calling you, calling the best out in you, basically. And so beyond that, it's the other friendships. It's the other relationships. It might be, you know, uh, you might be close with your employer or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but those first three or four circles of intimacy they're like no traffic zones okay and this is why you have to protect that space if you don't protect that space no one else will protect it for you and as artists we can have a habit of wanting to share so much with so many people because we realize there's a warmth you know for some artists some artists are very you know they're they're, they're very good with their boundaries they're like you know if anything they they like being by themselves a lot and that's cool if that's how they're wired um i'm i'm i get energy from being with people and i also get energy from being alone uh i like to say i'm an ambivert uh because i have my days i call them my marketplace days and then i have my secret place days (laughs) and it's that space where i just don't i don't need uh to be around people i'm happy i've got things to think about i've got things to write about i've got things to pray about um, I might have a, a series I want to catch up on, um, you know, some recording to do, you know, uh, just some, you know, really light administration, creative administration, whatever it may be, whatever fills you up. Um, it fills my cup to get all those things happening. And, and, um, and that's, that's one of the ways where I meet with the Lord. Um, but yeah, I also get energy from being with people. So I cannot, I cannot, uh, be away from meeting with people that I love for longer than a week or two. Like I've got to, I've got to have that time with people that I love and, and get along with and, and people that I feel the way there's a synergy with. Okay. And so you got to know who those people are. Know when, when your, when your secret place days are happening and when your marketplace days are happening. So those in, I just wanted to touch on that because it's, it's one of those things that I know for me, I come back to reassess how am I doing with that? Um, and you know, we all can relate to David because he violated every one of those circles in his, in his, uh, years of reign over Israel. He, he violated other people's intimacy circles. He violated his own. Um, and so he had many failures in that area and it's re it's really good, uh, to be able to look at that and go, wow. Okay. Uh, I, you know, the measuring bar isn't too high. Not that that gives us permission to violate intimacy circles and things like that. I'm not talking about that, but there, there is a comfort in knowing his humanity his imperfection, his uh, sometimes lack of emotional intelligence on many levels, but yet God called him a man after his own heart. Yet he was anointed before he should have been in, in man's eyes. He was anointed just at the right time in God's eyes. You know, and that's that's what we've got to remember, guys, that David was never, he never had, God never held his sin against him. Even though David tried tried to keep secrets, it just did not work. God would come and find him through Samuel or through Nathaniel and said, you need to pull your act together. You need to walk like a king because that's who you've been anointed to be. And that's, and that's where God would bring him back to again, being the worshiper in the wilderness, worshiper among the sheep, taking down the lion and the bear uh, of shame and of temptation and of, you know, all these things he walked through. I, we can all relate to them because this, this is a place 
where God interacts with you intimately? And what's the difference between David and, say, Saul? You know, Saul didn't sin as badly as David, you know, as, you know, if we think about it in terms of that, did Saul commit adultery and murder someone for like, there's, there's a lot of things that David did that Saul didn't do. Now, Saul committed a, a lot of things that were, you know, different to David. But if we, if we put them next to each other, you know, um, <laughs> what's the difference? The difference is David always ran back to the feet of his creator. He always went back and, and, and tore open his heart before the Lord. Saul might have torn his, his garments, and that's as deep as it went for him. No, David went very deep with his repentance. He tore his heart open, and he would, he would cry out to God with fullness of honesty. And that's what I love, you know, and um, David Tenson's uh, podcast about, you know, that's a really amazing example of worship when it's honest. I think, you know, God is really sick of our pretentious worship. I'm, I'm really tired of my pretentious worship when I feel like I'm just worshiping out of pretense. I get really like, oh, that's gross. You know, I start smelling like plastic and I'm like, Lord, <laughs> I want to, I want a real raw and fiery, honest life of worship. You know, we've got to, we've got to maintain and protect that because that is, that is something that kind of separates us from other spiritualities. You know, there, you know, a lot of other spiritualities say, you know, this is the ritual. This is the tradition you do, uh, get rid of all negativity. And and I'm all for getting rid of negativity. Absolutely. But it's how we do it, right? It's how we go about it with God. We're called to spill our heart before him with God. We're not called to tuck it under the rug and sweep it under the living room carpet until there's a size of an elephant lump in the room. Um, you know, he says, no, bring it all out because I can see it anyway. You know, uh, you know, all this stuff you're wrestling with, all these questions and doubts you have, uh, your anger towards me, you know, the Lord confronts us on that. Not because he thinks you shouldn't be angry with me. Uh, it's more that, Hey, can we talk about this? You know, and that's what wholeness, that holiness draws it out in us to be incredibly honest in our worship. And there are times when, you know, you just put that negative process aside, put boundaries around that, uh, because otherwise all you do is vent all the time. And I don't think that's cool. I think that's just like toxic after a while. If all you're doing is venting in your worship, oh, Lord, I love you, but this situation's crap and this person's evil. And, you know, okay, all right, we need to get back to majesty. We need to get back in the glory of who Jesus is and get rocked by that, get get a good drink, a deep drink of that, because that's what makes us come to life. But we can't have that if we're not being honest and unveiled in our hearts. And this is what I love about David. He was He was unveiled in his worship, like think about when he returned the ark back to Jerusalem, that the prompt of the Holy Spirit, take off your garments and dance like a wild man to welcome the ark back, like so unconventional, so unorthodox, you know, orthodox didn't exist back then. Um, But, you know, every rule in the humanistic book of religion was broken by that guy, yet he was a man after God's own heart. Now, this should be a reflection of you. If you can identify aspects to David that you relate to, you resonate with, you know, you should be encouraged right now that there is nothing that is standing between you and a deeply honest life of worship with the Lord that he cannot resist. Because when we get honest and it's still pure, you know, we still like, you know, we 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 open our hearts. We're not just having intellectual negativity battle with the Lord of hosts. No, we spill our heart. And God cannot resist that. Just like the prostitute who ran in to uh, the Pharisee's house and broke the jar, the alabaster jar at the feet of Jesus and spilled that year's worth of salary in form of perfume um, and wept at the feet of Jesus, Jesus couldn't resist how honest and how vulnerable and how 
and how pure. Like everyone else looked at her and said, she is unclean. And Jesus thought, no, she's the cleanest one in this room right now. Why? Because she was, she was so honest. She opened up her heart and recognized him and laid at the feet of Jesus and wept. And that's true repentance. That's like, not that you have to weep every time. I'm not saying that. Like, you know, sometimes that's, that's what's said you have to do in order to be repentant. Uh, that's just weird. Um, God meets us on a case-by-case basis. He doesn't conform us into a cookie-cutter version of, you know, whatever we think is ideal. He just doesn't work like that. He's God. We're not. It works pretty brilliant that way. So let's stick to that. Um, but, you know, there was so much honesty and vulnerability at that place that Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached, she'll be talked about. And I love that because it says, you defame her, but I'm going to make her famous because of how pure her vulnerable act of worship is. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so it's like retracting away from our pretense and retracting away from the the, the fake, the plastic, the show, you know, we're here for a show. We're here to, we're here to look good for people. And so often we fall into that trap in the church where look, as long as the service looks really good, people will come back next week, you know, and that's, that's, uh, you know, very outdated, so outdated <laughs> that it goes all the way back to those eras where Saul just wanted to look good, you know, and, and all those people that just didn't have that intimacy with God. And as soon as you're not prioritizing intimacy with God anymore, you will live to please man. You will strive to make things look good for man. As soon as we don't know the approval that has been established upon our lives because of Jesus, we will keep chasing approval with people. It's just how it works. So it's, we've got to stay filled We've got to stay full of the favor and the approval of God, not gain it. I'm saying stay full of the awareness that we already have it. We don't need more of it. We've got all of it. Jesus gave us all. If he gave us any more, he'd be taking it away from him. He'd be taking it away from the father. (laughs) You know, there's nothing more he can give us that he has not already given us because he's living in us and he's given us his spirit. You know, God has given us our status as sons and daughters, as his beloved. That is what he's given us. There's nothing more he can give you. He's given it all to you. We've got to stay full of the awareness of that. We've got to stay full of the alertness, the stay alert about what we have received and and be aware of it because as soon as you focus your mind Wait, I have been given complete favor with the Father. Despite my failures, despite my mistakes, despite my rebellion, I've been given favor with God. The more we focus on the awareness of that, man, it just it becomes our operating system. And that's where God is, that's why the Holy Spirit's in us, guys. He's leading us into that space. So we've got to separate ourselves from the intellectual striving of man and keep coming back to the feet of Jesus, to sit at the feet of the King. Because when we do that, so much more is achieved at a deeper level. You know, when we don't do that, we might achieve a lot administratively and practically, and that's, that's all good. But when we come back to the feet of the King, we create space inside of us. We create space for God's dream to be expressed through us. So guys, I want to prophesy over you that though time has passed, experiences have come and go, failures have happened, even today, you know, people have come and gone. I want to prophesy that God is still central to everything he placed in you by design. I just want to declare over you today that you have not missed it. Jesus is still on the throne in your life. God is still central. His signature of approval is all over you. All he's asking for right now is your focus. All he's asking for is that you be aware of what he has placed upon you. 
because of being born anew, because you have been placed in the sun and the sun has been placed in you, because you have that favor established, you have those gifts established, whether you repent or not, that is upon you. That is the grace gift of God. All he asks is you stay aware of everything he's given you because that is your operating system. That is where you get to live from. You know, I liken the artist worshiper to a Davidic company, which sounds very triumphalistic and holy, right? But in so many ways, we have a journey of, yes, intimacy with the Lord, but so many failures, so many scars, so many bruises, mistakes, shortcomings, etc. But access to his glory by grace, access to his glory. The poets that don't ignore the mess, they're willing to be vulnerable. They're willing to be opened up and they're willing to go low at the feet of Jesus because they know that gives them life. I never regret spending time at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> I never get up and say, oh, that wasn't worth it, was it? I missed that meeting. I missed that. You know, that that never happens. <laughs> That's happened never. <laughs> Because this is the grace gift of God in our lives, is that we get to live from the feet of Jesus. And every gift you place at his feet, it's not lost. It just gets more beautiful and more, more pure. So we've all been through so much hurt, betrayal, mistreatment from the brothers who compete, you know, like David's brothers. They were always just to put him in his place. Here, tend my sheep, brother. You know, they were they were always ready to put him in their in in his place, the place they'd created for him. And I want to tell you, beloved, when people try to put you in your place, you remind them where you've been placed. When they try to put you in your place, you remind them where you've been seated, at the table of the Lord. You've been seated at the table of the King. You've been seated in Christ. In heavenly places. People tried to use you for your talent. You've been placed in Christ. You've been manipulated for someone else's bidding. You've been placed in Christ. You know, we've got to remember this, that yes, so much hurt and so much pain. And Jesus is so ready for us just to weep it out and just to let it all out and just say, Jesus, I want you to be for me who you've never been able to be for me until this moment right now when I'm willing to open up my heart at such a deep level and just let the pain come out and just and just say yes again to you, Jesus. You know, these moments are so priceless in the heart of God. And I want to encourage you today, wherever you are right now, you might be walking through despair right now. I'm not asking you to pick up a guitar and shout at the air. I'm asking that you would just take a moment and become aware that all the favor that Jesus loves and enjoys in God the Father has been given to you. We are rising, beloved. We are learning to make our yes our yes and our no our no. So I'm just going to pray for you and then we're going to we're going to wrap up, but I just want you to be encouraged today that a Davidic company <laughs> sounds triumphalistic, sounds unbeatable, but oh my gosh, so much pain, so many failures. Guess what? We're all in the same place. We're all on the same level playing field. And it's so important to remember that so that we're not competing or feeling like we have to measure up. Uh, the only measuring tool in the kingdom is the tool of love. You know, in, those who are the most mature among you will love the most. You know, those who are forgiven much, love much. And that's the other link to, to that woman at the feet of Jesus. For he who is forgiven much, loves much. And that's the character maturity level. And, you know, the beautiful thing about character maturity is when we really are maturing that it's actually going to flow into our art form. It's actually going to boost and upgrade our art form and make it more beautiful, make it more sturdy, make it more unshakable for all the storms that hit us. 
So, yeah, I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for my friend who's listening right now. I pray, Father, that you would that you would literally just uh, just pour out that oil. Lord, I thank you for rivers of oil from the rock, that the rock would pour out rivers of oil. Lord, that you'd bathe my friend's steps with cream, that you would bathe their steps with cream, the cream of your favor. Lord, I declare your friendly counsel over my friend as they listen and as they go about their day or their night or whatever they're doing right now, that you would have the friend, that the friendly counsel of God would be over them and in them and in their thoughts, in their meditations. Oh, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this life of worship that you've given us. You've given us, even the praise we give you has come from you. There's nothing that we can give you that did not originate, that that originated in us uh, because it's all come from you. And I just thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, just for the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the counsel of the Holy Spirit over the every every place that's needing that touch, that touch of healing. Lord, that touch of redemption, that touch of joy where there's been sadness, Lord. I thank you that you give us beauty for ashes and you give us joy for mourning. And while we are learning to become more raw and honest in our worship before you, Lord, I just thank you that you actually, you, you always come to us and say, the days of mourning are over. And just as it was with Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, Lord, when the opening up of the temple happened and the day of repentance came and and all of those amazing moments came. There was one day where they said there will be no weeping, but only laughter, only rejoicing, only fine food and fine drink. You know, there was just just a total flip of the tables of what people were accustomed to and traditionally used to and familiar with. You flipped it, God, because you love to do that. You're relational. You like to turn our formulas uh, you know, as being you know useless compared to being relationally current with you. And so, Lord, I thank you today in Jesus' name. I thank you for a fresh grace, a fresh fire, a fresh determination, a fresh confidence, Lord, healing to go deep and go deep and go deep in the heart of my friends who are listening right now. And I pray that you would spark in them, uh, Lord, a, a light like never before, enlighten the eyes of their heart that they may see that they may know, that they may experience everything that has been given to them in Christ Jesus, that there is nothing missing. There is nothing damaged in them, God. I thank you. My friend is not damaged goods. There is a mature wine, a vintage wine in my friend that that is being carried for a move of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to prophesy that over you, my friend, that whatever you've been through, God actually crushes the grapes because they become wine. And I just want to declare over you, there's nothing damaged. There's just a lot of vintage wine that the goodness of God has developed in you through everything you've been through. There's going to, so many people are going to taste the richness of what is on your life because of what you've walked through. And Father, I just thank you in Jesus' name for that. And uh, that you're the God who closes every door that no man can open and you open every door that no man can shut. Um, and so thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Bless you, my friends. So good just speaking just real intimately with you today, just talking one-on-one. Um, I really appreciate these times, and I really hope this has been a blessing to you. Uh, please remember to join the Facebook group if you haven't done so yet. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, you can uh, you can go to the artvanceanchor.fm site and actually drop us a voice message if you'd like to do that. Um, if you'd like to subscribe as well, there's a monthly, uh, cost to that, but you get bonus episodes and it also helps our channel get better and better, uh, to, to take it from glory to glory and be able to do more with what we're doing right now. So guys, thank you for being a part of it. It's such a blessing to have you on. I hope this has blessed you. I'll see you next time on Art Vance. Thank you again for joining us on this podcast. You guys, as our Art Vance community, are the reason we produce this podcast because we realize there's a need for the narrative of what God is saying right now concerning worship and the arts industry here in Australia and beyond. Live the unboxed life. Be uncontainable in God's heart for you to be released into your field. 
your open place and reveal Jesus to your people. See you next time on Art Dance.